Calvary Chapel, Mason City. All right, so for today, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20, Spiritual Warfare, Part D. Welcome again to Calvary this morning, and if you're watching online, I'd like to say welcome to you as well. If you didn't bring a Bible, uh, you can raise your hand. One will be brought to you if you'd like one. If you don't own a Bible, you can keep it. Today we conclude this section on the armor of God or spiritual warfare. Just a quick review. The belt of truth we talked about first. I'm going to go through the armor. I'm going to go through this again. You say, well, this might be tedious. He keeps repeating things. But it's kind of interesting. I think the devil really wants us to forget the things that we learn here on Sunday. I mean, I just think that he's against the teaching of the Word of God. So I don't think it hurts to just be reminded about what's going on. When you're experiencing attacks from the enemy, you have to understand how this armor of God works. So first of all, the belt of truth. The enemy attacks you with deception and lies. It comes through false teachers. It comes through, you know, all kinds of different sources. It can come through the enemy putting thoughts in your head, all kinds of different things. It can come from other Christians. You might meet a Christian here that comes and says, hey, I saw this, I heard this, and they might bring false teaching to you. So you have to stand wrapped in the belt of truth. The belt of truth represents the whole Word of God, everything that's in the Word of God. And so that's how you're protected from deception. Listen, when you get deceived about something and when, you get, when false teaching makes its way in, belief leads to practice, all right? What we do is all tied to what we believe. So if you get some false thing in from Satan, you start living in some way that's contrary uh, to what God has, it's going to have a bad effect in your life. And so it's important to stand in the belt of truth. Next was the breastplate of righteousness. The enemy will try to accuse you of past sins and failures and your inability to be perfect and to live godly and all these things. And so when you're standing in the breastplate of righteousness, it's standing in the awareness that your righteousness is not your own. It's been given to you by Jesus Christ. And so when the enemy attacks and he says, hey, you're not measuring up, you say, I know, that's why I need Jesus. I mean, go take it up with him, you know. And so the next thing, the shoes of peace. And some people have interpreted this as the, the readiness to go preach the gospel, and, and I don't think that's what it means. It, it's talking about the peace that comes through Jesus making peace by the blood of his cross, it says in Colossians. Jesus made peace between a God who is going to and has poured out his wrath upon sin Jesus made peace by the blood of his cross between that God who will judge sin and sinners. So now today, the war between God and me, it's over because of what Jesus Christ did. And that's the shoes of peace, standing firm in that foundation. Listen, Satan will come and try to rob you of your peace. But you remind him, I'm standing firm in this foundation of what Jesus Christ has done for me. Right? And when you think that, when you stop in a season of anxiety and worry and panic and all that, and when you stop yourself and you say, look, there's nothing that can touch me. I'm standing in Jesus Christ. And when you tell yourself that in your mind, you'll find that you're standing firm in the attacks of the enemy. That's how you apply it. Don't forget it. You're going to need these things if you haven't already learned that. Now, the next one, the shield of faith. The enemy launches you know, seeds of doubt temptations, all kinds of different things, fiery darts, evil thoughts, lustful thoughts, perverted thoughts, all kinds of stuff. The devil's constantly shooting it at you. But the shield of faith, um, you know, it acts as a protective barrier, enabling us to extinguish these attacks by unwaveringly trusting in God's promises. The sword of this, or I'm sorry, the helmet of salvation was next. Uh, the enemy wants to fill our minds with despair, doubt, confusion, disappointment, uh, discouragement. But the helmet of salvation guards our thoughts because we know that this life isn't it. Our salvation, our complete salvation, one day we're going to be like him. We're going to see him face to face and we're going to be like him. Do you know that we know what the end is like for Christians? Did you know that? There's no uncertainty for the Christian. Christian says, I don't know what the world's coming to. I'll say, well, my friend, you haven't read the Bible then. Because you know what the world's coming to. So there, there's no reason for a Christian to be running around panicking, saying, I don't know what's coming. I know exactly what's coming. Let me show you. Pick up the Bible. That's why God gave it to you. I know that one day that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And I'll live in that earth, and there will be no tear, there will be no pain, there will be no perversion, no disgusting, no filth, no nothing like that. And I will stand. There won't even be light in there because the Lord himself will be the light. 
and I'll stand with him and I'll praise and worship him for eternity. And it's not going to be a bunch of people floating around on clouds and things like that. It's going to be just, it's going to look like this, only better. It's like God, God, you know, intended a certain thing in the Garden of Eden and it got tainted. This will be no, no tainting, no fall in the whole place. And you'll live and you'll live lives. You'll, I don't understand all of it, but it's going to be kind of like life now, only way better. <laughs> and so... We know the end of the story as a Christian. And so when he comes and he fills your mind with doubts and discouragement, you say, why? Why would you be discouraged? Oh, my soul, why are you discord within me? Why are you cast down within me? Hope in God. Now, the next one, the sword of the Spirit. The enemy often uses false ideologies, deceptive philosophies, man's philosophies, uh, distorted interpretations of Scripture to confuse and mislead us. And listen, the false teachers in this world are incredibly deceptive. So this is why you need to know the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You've got to know the Word of God, front to back. It takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. And this is a defensive weapon. This is also an offensive weapon. When we build our life upon the Word of God, what that does, when you, see, when you come out of darkness and you come into the light and you start building your life upon the Word of God, all the, all the dark things that your life has been built on, they start to get undone because they start getting replaced with truth right? This faulty foundation that you were built on starts being dis dismantled as you're built on this new foundation now. And people, you know, people get into psychology and there may be a bunch of help in that and I don't know. Um, it's a lot of it's man-centered philosophies trying to fix something. Here's, here's the whole thing. I don't need to go back and look at every little detail of my life and try to figure out and make peace with my uncle that, you know, wasn't nice to me at Christmas or whatever it is. I don't need to even worry about all that stuff. All I need to do is just start right now, start building on the foundation of God's word and that old life is going to get dismantled as the new life gets installed. And so it's not only a defensive weapon, it's an offensive weapon. And it also, when the enemy tries to attack in certain situations, you can use it like a sword. And we talked about the concept of the rhema word. The logos is the word of God. It's the entirety of the word of God, uh, the belt of truth. But the rhema word is the word right for this situation right now. And I do think there's a great need for Christians to know the right word for the right situation. And I know that because I get a lot of calls about people, you know, saying, what's the Bible verse for this situation? I think that's great that you want to apply the Bible to this situation. That's a great thing. That's the rhema word. We need that word to fit into the situations of life. That's the sword of the Spirit. Now this brings us to the place of prayer in spiritual warfare. To use the spiritual of armor and God's word effectively in our battle, we must pray. So, Paul's instruction, Paul's prayer instruction, number one, verse 18. Look at this, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let's pause and pray, please. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word here today. And Lord, we ask that you would make the book live to us. Lord, that you would show us ourselves, that you would show us our Savior. And Lord, that you would instruct us beyond the words of a mere man, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, and we do welcome and invite you, Lord, to teach us today. Equip us, encourage us, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. The importance of prayer. The armor of God isn't some mechanical, mystical thing that just makes you effective in spiritual warfare. It must be activated with prayer. I know a guy that bought a house a long time ago, a friend of mine, he bought an acreage, and he, um, I'm hoping to do that one day, by the way. I just would love to have a nice retreat center where we could all go together and have a Christian retreat. And my friend bought a, an acreage, and one of the things during the walkthrough that he was really stoked about was the security system. I mean, he was looking at all the cameras all over the whole place, and he, this was great. And so what he did was he moved in and uh, went to the panel turned the thing on and, and nothing happened. So he had all this armor, but nothing happened. He found out why. The guy didn't have it wired in. <laughs> the electrical wasn't wired in, so it didn't work. Impressive system. Not all the armor was there, but no power. And that's very much like what the armor of God is like in the life of a prayerless Christian. You might know Bible verses. You might go to church. But if you're not in prayer, if I'm not in prayer, it doesn't, doesn't benefit. Now, that's what he's talking about here. There are at least a few Christians in this world that need this reminder. 
that Paul is going to give out here. He's going to tell us six things about prayer. You can jot them down if you're a note taker. There they are on the screen. The frequency of prayer, the variety of prayer, the empowerment of prayer, the manner of prayer, and the objects of prayer. Notice there's just one word that changes every time. Frequency, variety, empowerment, manner, objects. If you need an acronym, VEVIMO. No, <laughs> no, no, that's not very good homiletics right there, right? It's not going to stick with you, but there they are. First of all, let's talk about the frequency of prayer. Notice what he says in verse 18, please. He says, praying always. Now, the Greek word would reveal he's talking about on every occasion, every occasion. Many of us are like the person that exercises for a few weeks after a bad doctor report. But then we slip back into being overly confident until the next time something bad happens. I was reading statistics about how many people start going to the gym after a bad doctor report and then quit, and it's just like 90-something percent do. But that's how we are by nature. We're overly confident. And that's why we don't pray on all occasions. We pray on some occasions. In fact, some of us only pray when things are going bad, poorly. But Paul says that we need to pray on all occasions. That's what he's getting at, all types of occasions, ups, downs, lows, all arounds, all are occasions for prayer. It's the frequency of prayer all the time for everything. Number two, the variety of prayer. Now, he says, with all prayer, notice in verse 18, we're really going to take verse 18 apart here. He says, with all prayer and supplication. He uses two words for prayer here. First of all, the word prayer is just a general term that includes all kinds of prayer. Here are some of the different kinds of prayer you might add to this list. These, I believe, are some scriptural types of prayer. The first would be adoration or worship. This is really the most natural sort of prayer. This is the prayer that arises just naturally from your soul, from your spirit that, you know, you're going through life and you just say, oh, God, you're so good, you know? You drive, you go to, you know, Zion National Park and you go hiking with your wife and you're up there at the top of the angel's landing. Well, we didn't get that far, but... And you just look and you say, God, you're so good. You make things so beautiful. Why do you do this? Or you watch how God works in somebody's life and you say, man, Lord, I've seen you turn that person all the way from dark to light. They went from the back of the church to the front row, <laughs> you know? And you say, God, you're so good that you work like this. That's just worship and adoration. It's a good, important part of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Worship you. Holy is your name. Confession, that's another type of prayer. Laying your sins out before the Lord. Recommended to do every time that you pray. Lay, lay your sin out before him. Um, forgive us our trespasses, as Jesus taught. It's a good thing to lay out all your sin before God because the thing is he knows all of it anyway, right? He just knows everything about you. And he wants to cleanse you and forgive you. That's why it's so important to, you know, he wants to restore that fellowship. Thanksgiving, pouring out gratitude for all God's blessings that he's given. Petition. Uh, this is asking for your needs to be met or supplication. Um, give us this day our daily bread. Intercession, this is speaking to God, asking for the needs of others to be met. You're praying on behalf of others, interceding. Probably the hardest type of prayer because it involves laboring for other people. Uh, some people are really gifted in this, and I thank you for you that are that pray for me, that pray for Aaron, pray for this ministry. I thank you for those that have the gift of intercession. We wouldn't have a church if it wasn't for you. Now, there's another type of prayer, praying in tongues. This is the type of prayer in which our spirit prays, but our intellect is unfruitful. Paul said that he did this regularly. Uh, he said he did it more than all the Corinthians. He wished all of them did. Uh, not all have this gift. The Bible says, do all speak in tongues? Do all prophesy? Obviously, the answer is no when Paul's asking, you know, rhetorical questions. But it is a different type of prayer. There may be others, but these are the main types that we see in the scriptures. Now, the next word that he uses for prayer in verse 18 is the word supplication. So not only are we to go to, he's just saying go to God with all types of prayer, but now he's saying specifically petitioning God, 
special, specific requests as well as all types of general prayer. Now, general prayers are okay. You know, you sit down and, Lord, I just want to thank you for this day and it's really good and amen and bless us and, and stuff like that. That's okay. But we should get very specific about our prayers as well too. Uh, take these specific requests. That's the idea of a petition is a specific request being taken before the Lord. So that's what Paul uh, gets into saying right here. He says, pray always. That's the frequency. And then he says, use this variety of prayer, all types of prayer. Notice the word all. It shows up in the Greek in like four times in this little section right here. All times, all types of prayer. And then later on, he'll say for all the saints. It's just all is like the main word over this uh, verse here. Now notice the next thing is the empowerment of prayer. He goes on in verse 18 and he says, um, in the spirit. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Now what it means to pray in the spirit is uh, there's, you know, you could read a bunch of different commentaries. You're going to get different answers, especially when you read like Baptist uh, cessationist versus charismatic, you're going to get a whole bunch of different stuff. On the far charismatic side, um, they would say that praying in the Spirit is strictly limited. That, that's a term meant for praying in tongues. Now, that's not what the Bible teaches. It certainly includes that, but you don't have to have the gift of tongues to pray in the Spirit. A definition for what it means to pray in the Spirit, which I think is a nice balance of what everybody's saying that I read here, it simply means praying dependent upon God and under the guidance and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. He's prompting your prayers. He's empowering you. You're filled with His Spirit, and these prayers are coming from your soul that's, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit. These prayers come from the Spirit-filled person and are aligned with God's will and purposes. So I'll read it again. It simply means praying dependent upon and under the guidance and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. These prayers come from the Spirit-filled person and are aligned with God's will and purposes. So that's what it means to pray in the Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit will help you when you don't know what to pray, Romans 8, 26, amen? I love that. I sit down, I've been in a lot of prayer meetings with people where they say, I don't know what to pray. Say, oh, good news, let me show you Romans 8, 26. The Spirit helps us in our weakness when we don't know what we ought to pray. And he says, he makes intercessions for us with groanings that cannot even be uttered. So as I'm sitting there, I know that the Spirit is just interceding for me. You know, I can be praying, Lord, I don't even know what to pray, but I could just sit there. I could even groan in the Spirit. I could just be like, Lord, oh, 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 oh. You know, I mean, he, he, knows where, he knows what's going on, you know. You can pray in tongues. You can just, you can just give it to the Lord. He knows what's going on. Uh, a cessationist view of, of the groaning verse that I heard that I really liked, a guy from Dallas Seminary, he said, God takes our prayers that are like an F paper and turns them into an A paper before they're submitted to God. <laughs> like, that's pretty cool too, you know. That's the idea is that he's helping us to get this prayer that God's leading us to pray. He's helping us get it out to him, you know, in, in a way uh, that is powerful and, and uh, you know, and blessed. It says in Jude that we're to uh, build one another up, build yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. That's what he's getting at here. Praying dependent upon, under the guidance and empowerment of the Holy Spirit from the Spirit-filled person. These prayers are aligned with God's will, with his word and his purposes. The frequency, all occasions, the variety, all types, the empowerment, the Holy Spirit. The next thing, the manner of prayer. Being watchful to this end. Reminds me of the little boy Sam that sat down to Thanksgiving dinner with his brothers and sisters and his dad and his family and the smell of stovetop and gravy and all those things. And dad said, let's sit down and let's, we're going to say grace. And so he leads the prayer and everybody puts their head down and bows and closes the eyes. And all of a sudden, Sam's little brother says, Sam's got his eyes open. <laughs> and so he replies back to him and he says, how'd you know? <laughs> uh, right? And then he looks at dad and dad's giving him a look and he says, look, dad, I was just being watchful in prayer. <laughs> now, is that what this means? To keep one eye open while you're praying? That's not what it means. I mean, it could maybe. The idea of being watchful is found throughout the whole Bible. Matthew 26, 41, Jesus says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Do you remember that? The night before Jesus was crucified in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said to his disciples, he says, wait here, watch and pray. I'm going to go over there and pray. And then he keeps coming back and finding him sleeping. He told Peter, he said, watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. And then when the opportunity came to deny Jesus, you know, a little while later, what did he do? 
He gave in to temptation. And Jesus said, look, I, I told you to stay awake so you'd be in pray so you didn't fall into temptation. So that's Jesus talking about watch therefore. So being watchful in our prayers, understanding that you know, there's this, uh, the, our spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So I'm being watchful, recognizing the fact that I'm, you know, I could fall into sin and fall into temptation. Mark 13, Jesus says, take heed, watch and pray. For you, don't, you do not know what time it is. He's talking about in relation to the end times there with the coming of the Son of Man. He says, watch, because you don't know, you don't know when the Son of Man's going to return. There's an imminence when it comes to the rapture. We don't know when the rapture is going to happen. He says, keep watchful. That's the whole, really the whole application of end times is be watchful, you know, of eschatology. First Thessalonians 5, 6 Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober, right? 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. A Christian should be watchful like a soldier. That's what he's getting at here. Weist, in his Greek commentary, says watching. The word means to be sleepless, to keep awake. It means to be attentive, vigilant. It is the opposite of listlessness. It's expressing alertness in our prayers. Be alert, be watchful. Wake up and realize that you are in a spiritual battle and you better live like it. If you find yourself getting tired when you're in prayer, this verse is saying you've got to watch out for that. You've got to be watchful. You've got to be alert when you're praying. You and I are to pray on all occasions with all types of prayer empowered by the Holy Spirit, alert in a state of watchfulness. Look at the persistence of prayer next in verse 18. He says, with all perseverance. With all perseverance. You remember uh, in Genesis 32, the story about Jacob. And he wrestled all night with God in prayer. You remember the story? And he says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And then God figures out he's not going to let him go, and so he puts his hip out of socket and he blesses him, you know? That's the idea of persistence in prayer. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I love that. What persistence. Notice how he blessed him by putting his hip out of joint. I didn't think that was a blessing. I thought I was supposed to have health, wealth, and prosperity. Well, listen, sometimes God puts your hip out of joint because your attitude's out of joint. <laughs> And then you'll live the rest of your life in humble submission to him, maybe. You know? I can't tell you that's why God put his hip out of joint. I don't know. But I know in that same setting, he said, you'll no longer be called Jacob, but you'll be Israel. And he changed his identity. And that's really telling because Israel, uh, you know, his, his name before Jacob, you know what that means? Heel catcher, which is a term that's archaic, but it means manipulator. And so he changed his name from manipulator to Israel and he became the father of Israel. And that's a beautiful thing, right? So wrestled with all God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Exodus 17, 11. During the battle between Israel and uh, the Amalekites, do you remember? The battle was victorious as Moses had his arms in the air interceding. But remember, his arms would get tired, and so Aaron and Hur came and held his arms up. He had people, he had men alongside him in the ministry, helping him intercede for the people, and as long as his hands were up, the battle was victorious. But when they came down, not so much persistence in prayer. Luke 18, Jesus talks about this widow that went before this judge day and he, all the time, day after day, to get justice for someone that had wronged her. You remember the story? And uh, the judge, in, Jesus says in the parable, this judge, he really didn't care about the situation. He didn't fear God. He didn't fear man. But this widow kept coming in all the time, give me justice, give me justice. And finally, he says, look, I just want this lady to stop. <laughs> so I'm just going to do what she says. <laughs> And the point of the parable, Jesus is trying to encourage persistence in prayer. And he's saying, look, if this corrupt judge eventually will give in to the incessant prayer or incessant pleading of this widow, how much more do you think your heavenly father is going to answer your persistent prayer? Remember the other one Jesus talks about? He says, a friend comes at, you know, midnight and he comes over to your house and he says, I got guests coming over. I need some bread. And he keeps knocking on the door. He says, hey, you keep on knocking, but you can't come in. <laughs> and then uh, eventually he gets up because he just he keeps knocking. The lesson is to be persistent, to keep on asking. Matthew 17, 11, guy's got a demon, can't be cast out by the disciples. And so they come up to Jesus. Jesus, my son has this demon. 
Your disciples can't cast it out. Jesus cast it out. And then he looks at his disciples. He says, faithless generation, how long am I going to bear with you? He says, don't you understand that this demon only comes out by what? Prayer and fasting, right? So persistence in prayer, if you don't have persistence in prayer, you probably don't have, you know, uh, much, you know, much success in casting darkness out, right? Mark 10, 48. <sighs> Guy beside the road. They warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. He didn't give up. Acts 1, 14, about the early church. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. This was the story of the early church. They were all together in accord in prayer together, the whole church. Ask, seek, and knock, it'll be open to you, Jesus says. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. The frequency, all occasions, the variety, all types, the empowerment, the spirit, the manner, watchfulness, persistently. Finally, the objects of prayer and supplication, verse 18, for all the saints. There's the word all showing up again. For all the saints. We are to be in prayer for all the church. This starts with those in your home, your church family, and the church as a whole. Global church for saints. You can't visit every country or every church, but in prayer you can engage in the spiritual battle with anyone, anywhere. It's kind of exciting. You can go into your prayer place tonight and go get involved in the battle. When Ken and Kasha go to Uganda next time, you can join them on the mission field in prayer. They certainly need it. To say that the church in America needs the church in America's prayers is an understatement. One in five youth pastors and one in seven senior pastors use pornography on a regular basis and are currently struggling. That's more than 50,000 U.S. church leaders are involved in pornography regularly. To say the church in America needs the prayers of the saints is an understatement. 64% of Christian men and 15% of Christian women say that they watch porn at least once a month. I didn't even know women were into this stuff. But it's kind of an aside, but when women in a society, in a culture, become perverted, that's a sign. I mean, the men go a long time before the women do. But typically, when we look at civilizations throughout history, when the women start becoming perverted and corrupt, that's when you know that you're ripe for judgment. could actually be a sign that we've been given over to judgment. 68% of divorce cases involve one party meeting a new lover over the internet. 56 involved one party having an obsessive interest in pornographic websites. 56% of divorces in the church that take place are due to one of them having an obsession with pornography. I just say that because the church in America needs your prayers. We could go on and, you know, we could say a lot of things about churches turning from the inerrancy of Scripture, turning from the preaching of the Word of God, turning from uh, even Christianity and becoming more like the culture than they are like the Bible. We could say all kinds of stuff. The church needs our prayers. The church in America. Remember, this is in the context of spiritual armor, this talk about prayer here. Consistent prayer is to be made for all the saints. I want to tell you, as you're sitting here today, some of our brothers and sisters are obviously on vacation and it's, you know, but this is good because you can really see one another. In this church, the impact of your prayers is felt and experienced by the people sitting right next to you here. If you consider Calvary Chapel to be your home, it's kind of expected of you that you would pray for the people that come here. We expect it and we need it. We need your prayer. You know, I have the wonderful privilege of pastoring this church, but also at the same time, I, I get it grieved at times because I, can, I watch the enemy take people out systematically, and I see them go through these seasons of where they're just getting thrashed by the enemy, and I, I wonder, are we praying for these people? You know? If we're all praying for one another consistently, um, I, I think that's really important. Like I said, I, I think we feel that. We, we experience that. You can help the spiritual growth of everybody sitting around you by praying for them. How do you pray for them? Well, pray for their homes to be filled with the Word of God. 
Pray for their marriages. Pray for the families, for the singles, for those struggling with sin behind the scenes, for those dealing with discouragement, for those who are wandering, for those who are working hard in the kingdom to be encouraged. There's all kinds of things you can pray. We should be connected enough with one another to know what is taking place in one another's lives. Now, I fear sometimes that church becomes business as usual in America. Listen, if this is the highlight of your Christianity is going and attending a church service for an hour and a half on a Sunday, that's, that's not enough, man. Christianity, being a follower of Jesus, is a lifetime thing. We come here just for a little sliver of time to celebrate Jesus. This is not where Christianity really takes place. This is just a celebration. This is a Jesus party, you know? The discipleship really doesn't happen here as much as it happens everywhere else and the connections that people have with one another outside of this church. The early church saw their homes as ministry centers. They exercised hospitality. They had people over. They got to know one another. They spent time sacrificing their time and their resources to be in the lives of these people that they're here with. That's what church is. That's winsome, by the way. That's why people were drawn into the church. We should certainly know enough about one another to be able to pray for one another. That's on the people that don't take the time to get to know one another, and that's also on the time, that's, that's on the people that bolt out here before anybody can get to know them. So uh, we, should, we should work at this. These prayers are necessary. We pray at all times with all types, empowered by the Spirit, watchful, great persistence for all the saints. Before we wrap up, I read an interesting illustration this week about an African village. Uh, When the gospel had come there, the men of the village became very serious about being obedient to Jesus in all the spiritual disciplines, especially prayer. They emulated what Jesus did in prayer in in this village. What are some things that we learn in the Bible about Jesus' prayer life? I'm just going to give you a few. First of all, he started his day with prayer. Mark 1.35, now in the morning, having risen long, a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place and there that he prayed. Jesus started his day with prayer. He thought it was important to uh, get in contact with the Lord, you know, with his father right when his eyes opened up, I guess. You know, he, he considered it to be such a priority that before ministry got busy in the day, he made sure that he was prayed up beforehand. I'm really challenged by that verse in Mark because if you read what happened before that, it was like the longest day of ministry work ever. And then Jesus is up before the sun came up the next day and it's like, dude, there's some homework for you. Read in Mark what Jesus was doing the night before, Mark 135. And it's so challenging to me, man. Like, wow. Uh, What else about Jesus? So he started his day. He also went to secluded places to pray, wilderness, mountains, mountains. Matthew 6, 6, Jesus gives the same instruction to his disciples. He says, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. There's a very practical prayer instruction right there, is go into uh, some place and close the door. Um, Some of you might like to take this literally. I like to put a stool in my literal closet. And I go in there and close the door. And, uh, you know, I got a suit hanging in front of my face and clothes and all this stuff in there. And it's just something about it. You know, it's like, why are you in here? You're here to pray. That's unless you just hang out sitting in in your closet. No, I'm in here for one thing. That's why I'm here. Nobody can find me. It's cute. My dog, all of a sudden, I'll hear this like, (laughs) and he's coming sniffing the door. And I'm like, no, no, I'm praying. Leave me alone. (laughs) Good to have a secluded place. Jesus prayed before big decisions, didn't he? Luke 6.12, it came to pass in those days that he, Jesus, went on to the mountain to pray, and he continued all night in prayer to God. He was praying before he picked his disciples. Really? You were praying all night, and those are the guys you came up with? (laughs) Just kidding. Friends, here's just a thought. If Jesus needed to pray all night before making big decisions... I don't think it's wrong to assume that you and I need to pray before we make decisions. He also prayed so we could hear what the Father was doing. He prayed to be in close communion with his Father. You just don't bring a laundry list of stuff to God and that's it. You also sit in waiting to hear from him. He'll speak to you. He'll answer your questions. You know, he'll either say no, yes, maybe. He'll direct you in your prayers. I mean, you know, he'll, you know, no, yes or not. 
yet or, or something like that, and he'll, he'll speak with you. Wait on the Lord. Part of the Lord's prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done. That's discerning. It's asking the Lord for your will. So in this village, these new Christians, uh, Christian men, they were now walking up before, waking up before dawn, and they were walking out of their homes to secluded places to pray. And there's a picture that I brought with you. So what well, I, brought, I brought for you, you can see here there's this path worn in the grass there to go pray. And that's what was happening in, in this village is all of a sudden these, these different homes that these men and their families lived in, now there are paths going out into the secluded places to pray. And, and it was a really neat thing to see. Well, after a while, some of the men got tired of their spiritual disciplines and you could see the grass growing over the path. There was visual proof of prayerlessness. The very same thing is true for us. When we live prayerless lives, there's visual proof. How we make our decisions, how we handle stress. When you and I are praying consistently, we're standing firm in the armor of God. When you and I are praying consistently, the Word of God has effect in our lives. Power. The enemy attacks come, but we don't fall apart. The enemy attacks are par for the course for Christianity. If you're walking, following Jesus, it's just par for the course. It's like eventually you just laugh. At it. You kind of just like, I, I get it. I see his tactic all the time. But the thing about it is, if you're engaged in solid spiritual disciplines, you don't get knocked off course. When your path is not growing over, so to speak, you, you just don't get knocked off course. People will say, I wonder what to do when the enemy attacks me. Just have solid spiritual disciplines. Know the Word of God and pray to the God of the Word consistently. So simple. You could summarize, really, this whole armor of God section in those two things. Know the Word of God. Pray to the God of the Word. It's that simple. Don't get tripped up in all the, like, I wonder the breastplate, which one was the belt, or what's that, you know. Don't even get tripped up in all that. Know the Word of God. Know the God of the Word and pray to Him consistently. That's the key to spiritual warfare. Don't let all the stuff confuse you. Like, you don't have to know how to rebuke Jezebel and all these different other things like that. You don't have to know the Leviathan, Python spirit. You don't have to know any of that stuff. It may or may not be helpful, but you don't have to know it. What you need to know is the Word of God, and you need to know how to submit yourself to Him and pray and depend upon Him. Seek Him. Now, after the, telling the Ephesians that they're to pray for all the saints, he asked for prayer for himself. I think this is really great because I don't sometimes think that we realize need, leaders need prayer. Um, we see them and we say, oh, he stands up there or she, she sings or, you know, or she teaches Sunday school. She must be a super saint. Man, they need your prayer. And so Paul is a smart enough leader to ask people to pray for him. Verse 19, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, Paul was chained to a Roman soldier in a house arrest situation awaiting trial, and he made it to Rome to testify before Caesar. This, was his, this is what he set out to do. Uh, I don't know if he thought he was going to end up there this way, but here he is. And uh, he's in custody for being a follower of Jesus. And so what he's asking for here is boldness to speak the truth about Jesus in this hearing that's coming up. Now, the Jews that have been accusing him are likely going to be there. And so Paul needs the grace of God. He needs the empowering of the Holy Spirit to explain the fact that, look, Judy, it's, this is not some offshoot heretical sect of Judaism. And this is not uh, some, you know, insurrectionist group against the Roman government. He's got to stand there and he's got to explain, no, this is different. This is, you know, the church is this new thing. The mystery of the gospel is what he's talking about there. He needs to explain the mystery of the gospel, the fact that Jews and Gentiles are now together in this new body and he's going to preach the gospel to them. I want to point out this one thing and we'll end here. 
you know, of all the things that Paul could have asked for prayer for, he asks for boldness. He could have asked, could I please get out of these chains? <laughs> Just, will you guys pray for me that I get out of these chains? He could have asked for health, wealth, and prosperity. Can't I just have a life of prosperity? I mean, I see all these other people with, you know, you know all this stuff going. I mean, I, I looked at the prosperity of the wicked, and I almost fell until I went into the house of the Lord. Can't I just have what they have a little bit? He didn't ask for any of those things. He didn't say, Lord, Lord could I maybe have a life where they don't beat me and, you know, and stone me and throw me out of town and all that business? But he asked for boldness. It reminds you in Acts chapter 4 after the first Christians, remember they were beaten uh, because, you know, there had been a healing and they pulled him in, they beat him, and then they let him go. And uh, they go back and they have a prayer meeting after that. And they say, they say, oh, Lord, I didn't know that this being Christian stuff was dangerous. Please help me. No. They said, Lord, grant to your servants boldness that we may proclaim your word. That's just amazing to me. Paul is amazing to me that this is what he asked for. Notice how he says that he's an ambassador in chains. The word ambassador just means to be a representative. He's an ambassador in chains. And that really touched me this week because... He could have been a complainer in chains. And that's what a lot of people do. We're all wearing chains of some sort or another. Maybe you're chained to a hospital bed at some time. Maybe you're chained into some sort of mental deficiency. Maybe you're chained by some inability physically. Maybe you're chained by something. But Paul was an ambassador in chains. And he certainly thrived, even in his hardship, as he writes this beautiful letter from house arrest. He says, I'm an ambassador in chains. You remember in the beginning when he says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He never said, I'm a prisoner of Rome. He says, the Lord has me here. He knew that those chains, that the Lord had him in those chains to be a witness. He looked at his life, and he didn't grumble about his situations. He said, I'm going to let the Lord make everything that he can make out of me in this situation. I'm going to go even further and trust that the Lord has me in this situation on purpose. He's an ambassador in chains. How about you? Are you letting the things that you see as chains in your life hold you back? Or are you allowing the Holy Spirit to work through you right where you are? To use the spiritual armor, friends, and God's word effectively in our battle, we must pray. I want to give you some practical application here. You say, I need help with my prayer. Okay, copy Jesus. Start your day with prayer. First time that you recognize that you're alive and you're thinking and, and processes are happening, just as soon as you recognize that, just pray to the Lord. Don't feel guilty if you wait, you know, if you've been awake an hour and then you realize, don't, don't go into this like, oh, I was supposed to pray right when I woke up. Don't do that. Just as first, you know, as soon as you acknowledge the fact that you're awake, just start talking to dad. Just talk to him as your father. Talk to him. Copy Jesus. Start your day with prayer. Pick a secluded place. Maybe you can picture one now. Pick a secluded place. Make a place of prayer. Make your request known to God, but seek his will. Okay, if you need help with your prayer, these are some great things. Start your day with prayer, go to a secluded place, make your requests known, but seek his will. Pray in all situations with all types empowered by the Spirit, being alert, being watchful, persistent, praying for your family, for the church, for all the saints. Pray kneeling, singing, pray in tongues, pray groaning, pray yelling, pray standing, laying face down on the floor, eyes open, eyes closed. Just pray and be diligent. That's really the message here.